Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the EVO Institute for Jewish Research. And tonight, uh, we are going to be welcoming Yevgenia Albats to deliver the keynote speech for the inauguration of EVO's winter program. In 1950, Max Weinreich, the director of EVO and founder of EVO, wrote uh, a little pamphlet <clears throat> in which he said that the, the, um, the mission of the EVO Institute is to understand the position of the Jew in the modern world. The Jew. Not the Yiddish-speaking Jew or the Polish-speaking Jew or the Russian-speaking Jew, but the Jew in the modern world. And so Evo is truly dedicated to this mission through our archives, which I hope you all have a chance to explore, 23 million documents that pertain to the life of East European and Russian Jewry around the world, materials from every corner of the world, from Japan, from China, from Africa, from South America, from New Jersey. <laughs> but it is also through our educational programs, such as the winter program. And in particular, the winter program, which if uh, you have not yet uh, learned about it, I encourage you to do so. We attract scholars from all over the world to come and teach about subjects of special interest, whether that interest is women Yiddish novelists or philo-Semitic violence in Poland today, or the fate of Isaac Babel, or uh, the, the, the musicals of Avram Goldfaden. It is a place where we can talk about and think about and find instruction about things that simply are not taught anywhere else. But here they are. And it is a furtherance of our mission. It is a deep pleasure that we can find at this uh, point in time so many people still interested in learning about their past, their history, their heritage, their culture, and their place in the world, because our place in the world today is to a great extent predicated on the place that we had 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, and it's in our power to understand these things. So thank you all for coming. And I hope that you all have a chance to explore the offerings of our winter program, as well as our summer Yiddish program, as well as our, the programs that we put on throughout the year of many different sorts, on many different topics, from the Russian Civil War to anarch Jewish anarchism. Uh, uh, to uh, an opera that we will be staging in the spring, the spring uh, of the Dibuk. Um, we reach every corner of the Jewish world, and indeed through our online programs, we do indeed reach approximately 200,000 people around the world who are interested uh, in these subjects. So now let me tell you a little bit about Yevgenia Albats, if you don't already know. Uh, Yevgenia is a Russian investigative journalist, politi political scientist, author, radio host. Since 2007, she has been political editor, then editor-in-chief and CEO of The New Times, a Moscow-based Russian-language independent political weekly, it, which is how I first got to know of her work uh, during my time in Moscow. It went digital only in June of 2017 when its distribution and sales got severed by the Russian authorities. Since 2004, Albats has hosted Absolute Albats, a talk show on Echo Moskvi, the only remaining liberal radio station in Russia. 
Albatz was an Alfred Friendly Press Fellow assigned to the Chicago Tribune in 1990 and a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University in 1993. She graduated from Moscow State University. She has many awards, many honors, many accolades, but the most single, the single most important thing about Yevgenia Albatz is her voice and what she represents. So please welcome Yevgenia Albatz. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I should say that the uh, one, the most single important thing about me is sitting in the sixth row, my daughter. Uh, and she's, of course, you know, is the most important thing in my life. So I'm very grateful to Yiva Institute who, for, the, for inviting me. For those of us who know a thing or two about Vilna Jewish Academy, uh, Rabbi Gaon, uh, who heard that once in Lithuania there were 220,000 Jews, of which 210,000 were killed during the, uh, the Holocaust. Uh, of the entire Panevezhia's yeshiva, just there were 300 students in the Panevezhia's uh, yeshiva. Just three stu students survived. Now Lithuania is pretty much Jewish free country. Uh, still, I should say that in the last two years, there were made a very significant attempt to find some peace between uh, whatever Jews left there, but more between Litvaks who live all around the globe and who come to uh, the once Shtatal Maleti uh, almost each year from New Zealand and from South Africa and from the United States and from Israel to commemorate those Jews who were slaughtered there. And these marches in Malati uh, was, uh, were organized also by the Lithuanian intellectuals who, feel, who understand that it wasn't Nazi who killed Jews in Lithuania. These were Lithuanians themselves who fulfilled the duty as it happened in many other countries across Europe during the Holocaust. So of course, you know, Yiva Institute is an extremely important institution for those who uh, remember that once there was great Jewish civilization existed in Europe, Ashkenazi civilization that's almost uh, totally dead by now but it still exists in theaters and in the museums and the institutions like that. So thank you very much for having me here. Now, I'm curious how many of you speak Russian? Немножко. Немножко. Uh, let me do this. You know, of course, you know, the question that I was paused with, you know, to talk about the Jewish life in the contemporary Russia, it's a little bit a tricky one, as everything that has to do with Jews. Because you cannot talk about Jewish life just today, right? Jewish life, it's a process, you know. It's not just a process of many thousands of years, but even, you know, in the contemporary Russia, it's not just today. Because many of you who came to the United States from the Soviet Union, you remember the life where uh, Jews often changed their names for something more Slavic sounding, uh, where the quota for Jews in each and every institution was 3%, uh, as opposed, for instance, in Tsarist uh, Empire, quota for Jews was 12%. Uh, outside the Pale of Settlement and 15% inside the Pale of Settlement. Uh, of course, you know, it was, you know, you came from the country uh, where um, Jews were not allowed into the major uh, educational institutions of the Soviet Union. Uh, when 
that was impossible for Jews to make career in the, and maybe good, that they couldn't do this, you know, in the major institutions of the Soviet Union. By the way, in the KGB, since, you know, I've been writing, that's the point of my interest, I've been writing about the KGB for the last 30 years of my life, uh, Jews, were, were, uh, Jews were not allowed since 1964. There's still, you know, some were left because apparently those who undercover agents who worked in Latin America, uh, apparently since, you know, uh, Jews uh, looked very much like their Latin American counterparts in, in South American countries, so some of some illegals were Jewish. Uh, so uh, back to the subject. Should you ask me about what it's like, what's the Jewish li life like in Russia? Should you ask me 25 years ago? No, okay, not 25 years ago, 23 years ago. You would, uh, you would uh, hear a lot of enthusiasm on my side. It was the time when Jewish bankers bragged that they just re-elected Boris Yeltsin, who was sick, uh, uh, and almost dead at the time when the country voted him into presidency for the second time. Uh, he had a stroke and a heart attack a couple of days before this, the runoff. Um, so they bragged that you know, they managed to re-elect their own president. Uh, it wasn't exactly true. And I remember I was terrified by what I read in Financial Times and other newspapers where people uh, like Gusinski and Berezovsky, they were bragging about their, uh, their, um, uh, the possibilities and opportunities that existed for Jews in the then Russia. Still, it was the time when the Russian Jewish Congress was founded. It was the first time, at least you know, in my life, when Jews openly had uh, um, Hanukkiah um, in Moscow, where Jews had, op or Jews openly celebrated, even you know those Jews who didn't know what you know Agada was all about. Uh, Jews celebrated Pesach, Purim, and other holidays. I was the first uh, woman uh, uh, on the presidium of the Russian Jewish Congress, and that was amazing by itself because. Reform Judaism and conservative, even conservative Judaism doesn't exist in uh, Russia and didn't exist then. However, I was sitting in the midst of the Orthodox and Chabad Lubavitch uh, rabbis, and we were discussing the emergence of the Jewish life in uh, Russia. Back then, uh, members of the presidium, they were responsible for the certain activities, and Michael Friedman, the well-known uh, founder and owner of the Alpha Bank back then already, and uh, of course he's uh, known in that capacity as the head of the Alpha Group Bank now as well. We were you know, assigned to conduct all uh, uh, cultural activities related to Jewish history and Jewish contemporary art. Misha was financing those activities, and my job was to check that uh, each and every Jewish uh, ruble was spent for good, but not uh, used as a kickback. Uh, at that time, I remember, you know, we started the Jewish uh, library because no books existed whatsoever, just none. Torah was brought uh, from the outside world to uh, Russia. I remember the first time we published How to Run Traditional Jewish Household, great book that is written by, um, by the wife of the Orthodox rabbi you know, here in the United States, and so it was translated, but they forgot to do index. And I was saying, you know, wait a second, how you were going to use it? It's impossible. And then, you know, we, we started, we published a hell of a lot of uh, different books. You know, this Jewish intellectual thought was totally unknown. In, uh, in Russia, and so this was also brought to um, Moscow and other cities and translated into Russia. The most interesting part had to do with Torah scrolls. Apparently, as you may uh, know, uh, in the late 1920s and uh, early uh, 1930s, 
all the synagogues were closed in the then Soviet Union. You know, just a few left. Uh, um, many uh, rabbis, you know, they ended up where everybody else did in Gulag. Uh, and of course, you know, all this, you know, the treasures of the, uh, of the synagogues were distributed to different museums and uh, libraries and universities. So we, when we started our activities in the, uh, as a Russian Jewish Congress, we started looking for the Torah scrolls, because for God's sake, it's a very expensive affair to, uh, to do a Sofer Torah, you know, written Torah, Sofer Torah. Um, I remember back then the price was ninety thousand dollars to do the first to the whole scroll, and we were opening synagogues all across the country. And so uh, there was amazing thing when we found out that for some reasons in several police museums they had Torah scrolls. <laughs> of course, you know, different cultural institutions of the Soviet Union they had you know old editions. The famous Schneerson Library, which is a treasure for Chabad Lubavitch, uh, it was uh, found that in the, uh, the main uh, Soviet uh, library, Lenin's uh, library. So we started to collect these Torah scrolls. And uh, immediately people decided that they can make a money, a buck on, or two on Jews. Uh, but they didn't, they just, they had no idea why, you know, it was so important that apparently, I didn't know this, uh, I, I just learned it back then, that apparently you cannot just leave Torah to be somewhere in the, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, sitting there. You have to bury Torah, especially if, you know, in the, or if letters went down, you know, or, you know, you cannot read, then these scrolls should be buried. That's the treasury because you know we're people of the book, and that's our scrolls and our books, and you know it's important to preserve it. Anyway, so um, finally, Vladimir Gusinsky, the founder and the, great, uh, the first president of the Russian Jewish Congress, he went and he received uh, a signature the, from, the pri from the then prime minister of the Russian Federation, in accordance with which. Each and every museum, except for the most, you know, the biggest ones, uh, were supposed supposed to give uh, uh, back uh, Torah scrolls to the Russian Jewish Congress. So that's how that's all uh, started, uh, and it was extremely, extremely uh, exciting period of the um, Jewish uh, life. Uh, and then, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, Boris Yeltsin's family managed to choose as a, a Yeltsin successor a KGB operative by the name Vladimir Putin. Not because, you know, they had, you know, very good brains for sure, you know, they could, you know, there were a couple of better choices. Uh, but apparently at that time no one consulted Jews. And Jews, I should say, you know, they didn't have enough, you know, they, were, they didn't have enough brains as well to understand that by bringing one man uh, from the KGB into power, it meant not just one man, but the entire corporation of the most repressive institution of the Soviet Union was getting into power. And that's exactly what happened. Now it's just a common sense that Russia is run by the uh, representatives of the political police. However, so in 2000, one of the first things that Putin did, he kicked out Gusinsky out of the country, and Gusinsky is still in exile. He was never been able, he never been able to return back. Uh, and um, I remember one of the uh, uh, Putin's pals from the intelligence, Sergei Ivanov, 
later he was Minister of Defense and Head of Staff and etc. And you know, he's probably uh, not exactly needed. He was a resident in Norway and in Kenya and a couple of other countries, you know, the head of the Soviet Residentura in Norway, in Kenya, and a couple of other countries. But I remember he gave an interview to one of the popular newspapers, and, and he said that, oh, you know, Jews, they would never refuse to deal with, to help Mossad. So that's why we should be very careful uh, when we invite uh, Jews to different institutions connected to the military industrial complex. It was lovely to read, of course, you know, it wasn't, it's, it's not a new story, it was an old story that, of course, Jews are always a fifth column. Uh, however, um, uh, he was pretty quickly, he was educated. It was still, you know, the very beginning of the regime. And uh, this, uh, this notion, you know, this uh, theme pretty quickly disappeared. However, um, Jewish names from the list of those who staffed corridors of power and the major uh, agencies and institutions of Russia, these names also disappeared slowly but surely. Uh, 2004. 2004, great year, you know, I just graduated, uh, I got my PhD from Harvard University, where uh, the then chief rabbi of Harvard, Rabbi Benson Gold, blessed his soul, he's no longer with us. Uh, he, uh, he was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, his entire family um, perished in Treblinka. But uh, he survived. He was a 16-year-old. He survived. He was sent to Dachau, and he survived. Uh, so Rabbi Benson Gold, uh, he created at Harvard Hillel an institution by the name, uh, can, uh, you know, it was called Dvar Torah. Dvar, of course, word in Hebrew, right? And so, uh, you know, there was conservative con congregation, and I hope uh, it still exists at Harvard Hillel. And uh, each Saturday, uh, when we are supposed to read Torah Parsha, we were discussing, somebody was making dvar, somebody was giving a speech about, you know, this, the, this week's Parsha. And then there was this great intellectual discussion. It was absolutely hilarious. You can imagine uh, Harvard professors uh, discussing, you know, Parsha. It was, it was much less religious as much as it was secular, and it was extremely intellectually inspiring affairs. So I returned in 2004. I returned back to Moscow already as a professor at the Moscow University High School of Economics, where I was uh, teaching uh, political science. And I decided, and since, you know, I came to, to the Moscow uh, Orthodox School, you know, many of you who are from Moscow, you know that there is this big synagogue, choral synagogue, beautiful, and, you know, it's, it's located um, not far from Kremlin, this was uh, the, uh, you know, Moscow vicinity where Jews traditionally lived in the, uh, when they were allowed in Moscow, and the merchants of the first degree, they were allowed to live in Moscow. So they were lived, and, you know, they were kicked out at the turn of the 20th century by Germans, you know, for, because, you know, there was a totally business, uh, business dispute. But anyway, so I came to this shul, and apparently, I had to go to the second floor. And I felt like, what? Really? <laughs> I didn't want. And so I came in Talit and in Kippah. That's how I got accustomed to come to the services at Harvard. And there was <laughs> mail on the, on the floor, you know. They weren't exactly happy. They were terrified to see this woman. <laughs> but we have a great chief rabbi of Moscow, you know, uh, Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt. 
He's a Swiss born. He's, uh, he went to yeshiva in, uh, first in Jerusalem, and then uh, he graduated from John Hopkins uh, with a degree in computer sciences and in Baltimore yeshiva. He came to Moscow back in 1989, 1989, when Jewish life really didn't exist. Uh, I mean, you know, religious, intellectual Jewish life really didn't exist. And so, and so I remember uh, Rav Goldschmidt, he looked at me and then he said, oh yeah, today's a real, a real holiday for our shul. Evgenia Alberts came to pray with us. And all of a sudden, all this male, they sort of agreed that there was nothing wrong about you know, this Evgenia Albert sitting in Talit and uh, with kippah on her head. So it was, <laughs> it was very, very interesting experience. But still, you know, everything was sort of, uh, I'm not exactly a religious person, but I really love Torah. And I think that's tremendously interesting to, to read, to think about this, and then this whole body of commentaries that existed, you know, that were written through the centuries, Sanchina in Italy, uh, Russia in France, 12th century, Sanchina, 14th century, Maimonides, Naimonides, you know, uh, my, my most beloved uh, uh, scholar of Schmott, uh, um, uh, Hamali Bovich, uh, who lived in uh, Israel, and et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing in you know, a body of literature and very intellectually, it's very interesting to talk about this, to think about this, and to discuss this. Um, so I decided that I'm going to do some sort of, of uh, you know, a, a gathering by the name Dvar Torah. I couldn't do it in any shul, of course. Um, but first, you know, first, you know, uh, anyway, you know, the, the then um, Jewish center, um, it's now it's closed, uh, you know, so, so suggested uh, me some space. Anyway, and we started uh, running this uh, Dvar Torah on a weekly basis, first on I believe on Mondays, and then we moved on uh, on Thursday. Anyway, uh, each week I had two rabbis, one reform rabbi and one orthodox rabbi, sitting in the room because, as you're well aware, if, when it comes to halachical questions, only orthodox rabbi can answer uh, those questions. We were reading Torah and we were discussing it. At some point, there were as many as 70 people who were coming on a regular basis to the seminar. And whoever was anyone, regardless Jew, non-Jew, uh, these people were doing dwarves. People were doing you know, their um, commands and uh, their speeches on the weekly parsha. Everyone, you just tell me, you know, Gary Kasparov. Yes, Gary Kasparov did this. You know. Uh, Mikhail Friedman, each year, he did, Misha Friedman, he loved to do, uh, to talk about um, the second uh, uh, book of Torah, Shmot, right? Um, so, uh, and many, many, many others. It was extremely intellectually interesting affair, just amazingly inspiring and provocative. And, uh, uh, Jewish Torah scholars from uh, Israel, from Jerusalem, they were sending their people to Moscow and they were coming to my seminar and they were stunned to see that Orthodox rabbi, chief rabbi of Moscow was sitting you know, on the side and there was you know, this woman in Kippah and Talit who was running the show. So that was, so that is, uh, unfortunately, you know, I, uh, I was, uh, it, it was uh, uh, very time consuming because I had, back then there were, we didn't have enough books, so I had to send uh, to each and everyone who was to make a commentary, 
uh, to the weekly Parsha. I was sending, um, uh, I was sending Parsha. I was sending commentaries. Via, there is all kind of. There is very good uh, website menachim.org where you can find a lot of stuff. So um, and then. The, the New Times uh, was started, and I had to find somebody um, who uh, replaced me to run these on a weekly basis. Something like that is not possible now. Absolutely not. Uh, not because uh, authorities will be against this. I don't know how they will react. But first of all, there are very few Jews left. Approximately the Jewish immigration is 45% up in 2019 compared to 2018. 80% uh, of Jewish business is also gone. Uh, Jews, it's, I think it's not just that they no longer feel safe, uh, even though I do think that they don't feel as safe as they used to before. Uh, I mean, in uh, in the 90s, uh, but just you know, also business opportunities are gone. It is 2004, right? So 2004, 2005, 2006. That was very interesting. However, there was one accident that really made me to think twice. As I told you, you know, there is Chief Rabbi of Moscow, Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, a good friend of mine. You, you know, we're probably closest friends, even I never, ever shaked hands with him. Just never, ever. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a call from him from the Shremetia, from the Damodedovo airport in Moscow, as saying that it was six days prior to Rosh Hashanah. He was returning back from Jerusalem. You know, we, you know, high holidays in front of us, and, you know, there are a hell of a lot of preparations that have to do with this. And he's calling me to say that he's going to be deported. Wow. Of course, he's Swiss, by the way. You know, his grandfather was chief rabbi of Zurich, and his another grandfather was chief rabbi of Geneva. And his grandmother, Francesca Goldschmidt, was the famous woman who was uh, getting, was buying out Jewish kids from Gestapo and was getting them to Switzerland. So this is amazing family. His wife, Dara, she's from, uh, her family is in Mansi. So, uh, Goldschmidt was deported. His uh, visa, he had a working visa, was pronounced null and void. And we were unable to understand what's going on. It was 2005, I believe, something like that. Um, of course, you know, a lot of people got involved, and you can understand that, of course, all these you know, Jewish bankers who ever left went to um, administration of the president, and these and that. Uh, Sergei, you know, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, his daughter is married to an Orthodox Jew. So when Sergei Lavrov came to Israel, Sharon uh, back then was the Prime Minister of Israel. And of course, Sharon immediately spoke with Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. And Lavrov said, there is nothing I can do. It's KGB. And we did, we, it was impossible to understand what happened. Anyway, it lasted for more than a year until Chief Rabbi of Rome came to visit Prime Minister Berlusconi. Prime Minister Berlusconi of Italy back then, he was a friend of uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Berlusconi was a very right-wing politician, very corrupted. Uh, um, they shared this love, you know, for young uh, girls. Finally, you know, he was uh, he was accused of uh, having an affair with the underage girl. Anyway, so but back then, his prime minister and chief rabbi of Rome came to see Silvio Berlusconi because. 
Silvio Berlusconi was uh, facing elections, re-elections, and he needed Jewish votes. And then there were a little bit of Jewish votes, and chief rabbi of Rome had some say over that. And he came to Silvio Berlusconi and said, Silvio, something very wrong going on in Russia. Chief rabbi of Moscow is unable to get to his parish. You know, he was kicked out right before the uh, high holidays, and you know, there is another high holidays, and he's not allowed in, and something should be done. And Silva picked up the phone and called his friend Valodia and said, Valodia, I have, you know, Chief Rabbi of Rome sitting next to me. He's very concerned. What's going on? And Goldschmidt was sitting next to the, you know, was in the room. Uh, and Putin said, I, you know, Goldschmidt, yes, Goldschmidt. Tell him that if he, any time from now on, he will allow himself to get involved in Russian politics, he will not, uh, uh, he will not be able to come to Russia uh, again. Talking about Jewish life in Russia, I'm not going to give you names just because, you know, I'm, I'm sure that somebody is taping this. Uh, but you probably know that rabbis in the synagogues, besides being leaders of the community, besides being teachers, right? Uh, after the destruction of the second temple, we no longer have coins, right? So, uh, but they also very often they run get. Get is the Jewish court. So whenever the right business disputes existed between Jewish businesses, uh, and they don't want to bring those dis disputes to uh, the civil courts, or they don't believe in these courts, and Russia courts, court system no longer existed, so, or for whatever reasons, you know, Jews come to, to get. Get in. Get in, yeah. Bet. So, uh, to the Jewish court. Yes, bet in, yes. Sorry. So they come to the Jewish court. And... Apparently, FSB does want to know what questions are discussed at the court. In the Soviet times, in the KGB, there was the special department. There was the department number five, and inside this department, there was uh, a special department that was in charge of all things Jewish. So uh, in the current FSB, they reinstated this ideological counterintelligence. Now it's called Department to Protect Constitution. They always protect Constitution. <laughs> and they... <laughs> So the practice when uh, KGB, uh, FSB operatives come to different shoes and ask questions, um, let me put it this way, this practice pretty much has been resumed in the current Russia. So my guess that one of the major reasons why uh, FSB went after Goldschmidt was that Goldschmidt refused to cooperate with them. And you, of course, know that in accordance with the Torah, one Jew cannot report on another Jew. 
And of course, you know, for a buy, it's an impossible choice. So this is this was 2005, 2006. Fast forward 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. By now, by 2018, 22 rabbis were deported from Russia. The absolute majority of them, they are Chabad Lubavitch rabbis. You probably know a thing or two about Chabad. You know that you know they are everywhere. You know, I was in Western Australia uh, during the summer. And the first thing that, you know, the first person whom I met on the street was a Lubavitchi uh, rabbi. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, they were accused that there was some visa violation. In some cases, they were accused for propaganda. There is a book written in the 17th century about you know, how Jews were forcefully converted. So this book was pronounced as a terrorist literature in Russia. They just, you know, you know, these bureaucrats who made this decision, they're just pure idiots. You know? They just don't understand it. And they read something that they decided that was written against the Russian uh, Orthodox Church, and that's why they pronounced this book as a, as a terrorist book. So some of them, we, they were uh, kicked out uh, because of this book. Moscow Shul, uh, Moscow Synagogue, uh, on, uh, you know, this main Moscow Synagogue, uh, it was searched in August 2018. Also, video surveillance cameras were installed. One of the rabbis had to um, leave Moscow because uh, he was taped while he was in his office and the tape was put on, on the internet. And he's a young guy with six kids and his wife was pregnant with another one. And the tape when he was uh, satisfying himself. So that sort of became, you know, the environment of the um, everyday life of the religious community in Russia. Uh, December 2018, Leonid Volkov, a very well-known Russian um, uh, opposition leader, uh, a close uh, partner to Alexei Navalny, you know, the leader of the Russian opposition, and his number, um, Volkov is number two in uh, Navalny's uh, uh, fond uh, foundation against corruption. Volkov is observant Jew. So he's get, he got arrested, you know, uh, for the third or fourth time. You know, it's, it's going on a regular basis, so nothing new about that. But this time, it's Hanukkah. And for some reasons, he got an, arrested not in Moscow, but in the city on Volga River, Nizhny Novgorod, formerly uh, Gorky. His wife uh, called me up and said, oh, Zhenya, Hanukkah, and Leonid uh, is asking, is there any possibility for some rabbi to come to see him in jail? I said, you know, what a big deal. Of course, you know, what a big deal. You know, don't worry, Annie, about this. I'm calling Aron Gurevich. Please remember this name. I'm going to repeat it in each and every Jewish audience until I'm capable to do this. Uh, because, you know, black sheep should be as well known as all good guys. Uh, I'm calling Aron Gurevich, Rabbi, Rabbi, you know, he's Chabad Lubavitch Rabbi, and he is a liaison between the, Russian, the Jewish religious community and uh, so-called law enforcement uh, organizations in Russia, FSB, 
army, police, uh, uh, minister of internal. Of course, you know, Jews get arrested. Jews, you know, get sentenced. Some of them, they're kosher Jews, so, the, you know, they have to have, you know, kosher meals. You know, there are a lot of activities that uh, uh, existed. So I'm calling him. And I'm saying, oh, you know, hi, Rav, how you doing? Yeah, 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 Hanukkah, congratulations. You know, um, I was going to ask you, you know, we have, you know, a friend of mine, he's sitting in jail in Nizhny Novgorod, uh, Leonid Volkov. Leonid Volkov says, Aaron Garif, yes. Navalny is number two, yes. He's not Jewish. I said, no, 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 he is Jewish, trust me. You know, he's Jewish. Uh, but, but, you know, he wants to see Rabbi, you know. No, we're not going to send anyone to, uh, to uh, these guys who are trying to, uh, who are putting all us in danger because they speak against Putin. I said, wait a second. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. We're talking about a Jew sitting in jail who would like to see a Rabbi, well, you know, because it's Hanukkah. No, we're not going to do this. And, you know, we should check whether he's Jewish or not. You know, oh, OK, I said, you know. Now it's very nice, you know, go and ask him to take his trousers down. So <laughs> I was absolutely mad, to be honest with you. Of course, I found a rabbi in Nizhny Novgorod. There is just one rabbi, one shul. And uh, he happened to be a nice Israeli guy. And of course, he went to see Volkov. Uh, but then he had problems, and when the same Volkov was uh, jailed in Moscow, and there is a great uh, Chabad Lubavitch Rabbi Baruch Gorin, you know, great uh, specialist in Jewish, all things Jewish and Jewish literature first and foremost. He went to see him. He also ran into a lot of trouble. That's 2018, right? Uh, Having said that, and uh, I have to come to an end why, uh, uh, and answer your question, uh, as I was told. I should tell you that uh, there are no quotas for Jews in Russia. Nobody tells. Uh, Venedictive editor-in-chief of Echo Moscow to kick out Albats because she's Albats. Yes, you know, when I go live, I see, you know, a lot of uh, SMS, you know, a lot of messages that people send me, and, you know, every other message go to Israel and you dirty kai, you know, disciple. Uh, but, you know, that's a sort of, you know, uh, uh, part of the game. But no one precludes me from writing in Russian or from, um, or from having my shows. And you know, uh, while I'm here in the States, uh, University of Michigan kindly, they provided me with their radio lab. And I ran my show, it's live, each Monday, uh, noon uh, Eastern, 8 PM, Moscow. I go live each and every Monday. Uh, I have my own uh, uh, chair in the Moscow uh, uh, Orthodox Synagogue in the same balcony where Golda Meir um, used to sit when she first came to Moscow. I bought myself a chair there. Each week I pay money so to have it. And no one stops me from doing this. And I don't have problems because of that. And I, very often, I wear kippah, and I don't have problems with that. In fact, I remember when I came to Munich, and it was Friday, and Olga and I, we went to, we went to find the shul. And I was stunned to see that in Germany, in Munich, their shul was uh, uh, under the, uh, there was steel doors, there was an Israeli, Israeli guard, and there was barbed wire all around. So, mm, in that respect, it's much safer in Moscow than I would say in Munich. People in Munich, you know, I saw how men left, you know, the, after the service, 
they, you know, they walked out of the synagogue and immediately they took their kippahs off and they, you know, they didn't want to show that they were Jewish. At least, you know, they were not eager to do this. So, in that respect, and you know, and Jewish, uh, 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 there are um, different uh, in the current Moscow. I think there are five, maybe six different congregations. There is Reform. There is Conservative. There are uh, this uh, Shabbat, uh, Chabad Lubavitch, another Chabad Lubavitch, there is Hasidic synagogue. There are all kinds of shows existed, all kinds of communities existed, some of them in the school somewhere, in the, some in the prayer houses. Uh, there is a kosher store, there is a great uh, kosher gourmet. Absolutely, you know, the best, absolutely the best uh, gefilte fish in town. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, uh, uh, I go there on Fridays to buy very nice challah. Perfect, absolutely, two types of challah. It was impossible to find challah. I used to bring uh, matzo ball mix from the United States. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I love matzo ball mix. I love matzo balls. So it's all existed in Russia. And you know, in Marina Roshi, that's the, um, uh, that's, uh, I live not far from there. Um, you see uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews walking around with their tzitzi and pesi, and it's part of the normal life. It's no longer something, you know, unbelievable. I remember like when I first came to Chicago and there, there was a Jewish, part of Chicago back then, Jewish dictators called Devon. And I, I came there and I saw um, uh, Orthodox Jews in black dresses, you know, with, uh, with long pace and tzitzi. And I remember I sat on the pavement, I was crying. I couldn't believe that Jews could allow themselves to walk like that in, you know, in open. So, that's my answer to your question about the Jewish life and the contemporary Russia. I will be happy to answer your questions. And to Excuse me, I, I was expecting something else. Really. Uh, sure, we can well, open another well, shoe. I'll tell you what. When you're talking about the, the Jews from the former Soviet Union, number one, you have to, to come with hundreds of thousands. How many were at the disintegration of the Soviet Union? How many were in, uh, concentrated in which area of the former Soviet Union? Number two, what was the status of the Jews during Putin. In other words, how did he treat the Jews? How many of the Jews in, during Putin emigrated to Israel or to uh, some other places? Were they happy? They, uh, how they dealt with the new conditions? And uh, that's, uh, that's one of the things that uh, really uh, uh, political scientist has to, 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 to show to, to, to to explain, I mean, come on. Uh, that's a, a basic thing. Thank you. So your question is? The question is uh, what I was telling. Uh, what was, uh, the, how, many peop how many Jews had uh, Putin to deal with? Do, what do you mean he has to deal with? In other words, how many thousands or millions of Jews were in, the, in Russia, in the new Russia under Putin, and how many left for Israel? So and approximately 400,000 Jews live in Russia now. Uh, a lot of those uh, Jews who live in Russia, they have Israeli passport. And some say this is a passport immigration, because now it's very easy for a Jewish person to come to Israel and receive an Israeli passport. Uh, now, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I'm really, you know, I'm not in the position to tell you whether Putin does, uh, d deals with Jews or not. He meets with Jewish, b with businesses on a regular basis, 
And there are a couple of Jews existed, Misha Friedman, but he never comes to these meetings. Vexelberg, Victor Vexelberg, but uh, he's converted. He, uh, you know, when he was a boy, you know, he was baptized. But you know, I really, you know, and I, 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 these are, I don't know whether he deals with them or not. And, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not that interested about, um, I'm not interested about Putin as I'm interested about the institution of the presidency uh, and the institution of the political police that existed in Russia. You know, in political science, we tend not to talk about personalities. We talk about institutions. But you know, I, I'm I, I'm sorry that I was unable to uh, to uh, tell you what you were ex expected to hear from me. Maybe we can ask somebody else questions. Okay. Thank oh, you. Oh, I, I have a question. Uh, yes. Thank you for your talk tonight. Uh, I was wondering if you can address perhaps how the sanctions in the past couple of years might have affected. Jewish life, and what I mean by that specifically is, as some people might know, Chabad is a donation-based um, organization. Uh, and recently, when I was in Moscow, I heard from a couple of Chabad rabbis there that they've been hurting financially since the sanctions because it caused certain maybe businessmen or other um, funders to leave Russia. So I wonder if you can address how the financial situation maybe impacts Chabad's presence in Russia. And Jewish As life. I said, 80% of Jewish businessmen left Russia. So there are very few left. Now, of course, economic sanctions imposed after annexation, annexation of Crimea and uh, the war in eastern Ukraine uh, was very hurtful to Russian businesses. And they intended to be such. Um, whether it was uh, more difficult for Jews or not, I don't think that there is really difference with respect to, you know, when it comes to sanctions. Uh, it was r difficult for Russian businesses because Russian businesses got accustomed to run on the cheap uh, European money. It was very, it is very cheap to borrow money in Europe. It used to be very cheap. Uh, interest rates in the current Russia, I think, around 11%. Cup, uh, several years ago, they were 14%. When I was still running a business, it was uh, 22%. So uh, whereas in Europe, there, uh, one could borrow uh, money at you know, 2 3% plus LIBOR. So it's 4 5%. It's very cheap money. So yes, it became very difficult. Um, and part of the reason why uh, Russian, uh, there is no real growth of Russian economy. It's, you know, uh, it's about 1.5% uh, uh, is precisely because uh, there are no investments. And foreign investors, they're not coming to Russia. Michael Calvi was an American businessman, one of the founders of the Bering Vostok Company. Uh, which uh, invested in many uh, uh, good Russian companies like Yandex, that's the uh, Russian biggest IT company, and many others. He never was involved with gas or oil or anything like that. After my, my, uh, Michael Calvi got arrested, uh, you know, whoever left, whoever still, uh, uh, whoever uh, was in Moscow left. I mean, in terms of you know businesses. So, uh, I'm sorry. Listen, that it's not. Listen, when you were talking about, as I said, Russia is a country of 144 million people, and there are 400,000 Jews left. Now, what you know, what we're talking about, you know, whoever. Could already even however you know last two week, two years uh, summers ago I was in Irkutsk, it's eastern Siberia. There is a lovely synagogue, uh, Chabad Lubavitch Rabbi. They barely have minyan, but still you know it's, uh, there are uh, Jews live uh, live there. Apparently, 
this uh, synagogue was established at the end of the 19th century. But, uh, yeah. Um, in, the, uh, in the early 90s, uh, during the Yeltsin period, uh, I, I purchased a copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the gift shop of the Duma. Uh, mm -hmm. I purchased Ruskoye uh, Vaskrisenya uh, in kiosks around Moscow, as well as numerous other anti-Semitic uh, magazines and journals. Now, uh, Putin put an end to this. Uh, one cannot buy the protocols in the Duma any longer, as far as I know. And Ruske Vaskresenya is exiled to the provinces. <clears throat> Nevertheless, he, he seems to have uh, uh, some enmity or, or some negative uh, policies toward Jews, as you described. But do you think he has any actual policy? Does he have any actual um, a set of um, uh, concerns about the Jews. Uh, does he think that the Jews, the religious Jews, are a fifth column? Does he think that they're, they're uh, uh, taking over the media? Uh, it, what is the origin of this, of this negativity toward the Jews on the part of Putin, in your judgment? Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, I don't think that Putin is an anti-Semite. He's not. And it's known that he's not. I don't think that there is any uh, policies towards Jews. There is, however, the problem is that he is, he's, he's surrounded and he's also part of this uh, KGB institution, this political police. Uh, and traditionally, KGB saw Jews as a fifth column. In fact, there is nothing new about this in authoritarian states. Uh, dictators tend to choose some you know, enemies. And Jews are good for that, especially when there are so few of them. You know, I, when I was teaching at the high school of economics, um, I was, you know, I, um, had a lecture course on the transformation of Weimar Republic into the Nazi Germany. And I used to ask my students, how many Jews were in Germany in 1933? How many Jews were in Germany in 1933? Percentage. Percentage of the population. Right, 0 066 point uh, zero, uh, um, 0 0.76%. However, the absolute majority of my students, they used to say 15%, 20%, 30%. There is this assumption, Jews in Nazi Germany were in the very visible professions, especially in Berlin, you know, theater, dada, you know, uh, uh, banking Street was Jewish, uh, Jewelry Street was Jewish, you know. They were visible, right? So that's why I, um, there were very few Jews left. Uh, however, the fact that uh, FSB guys do install surveillance cameras in the shul in Schultz, right? Suggest that they feel like they need to control this place. They're control freaks. It's not that, you know, they really sincerely believe that Jews are going to sell our state secrets, whatever they didn't sell themselves, you know, that they're going to sell to, you know, to Trump. So he will pass it to Iran, right? <laughs> uh, no, they just control freaks and they want to control everything. 
like it was in the Soviet Union. There is, in that respect, there is nothing new that exi exactly the way it was in the Soviet Union. But Jews, you know, also, you know, they move back and forth, back and forth. There is, you know, uh, many of them, they have Israeli passports, they have, you know, American passports, and they move around. So they're not exactly very loyal and trusted citizens. But once again, no, I don't think that there is any policy. I think that in each and I'm, I'm absolutely aware, I would say that I pretty much know this, that each and every rabbi that was expelled was expelled precisely because he refused to cooperate, because he refused to provide information on his constituency, so to say. So that's, that's the, this, uh, but I don't think, and I don't expect them, to be honest with you. Uh, I remember when I was growing up in the Soviet Union, and many of you who came from the Soviet Union, you probably remember this, you know, when we were getting into, you know, in the tram, to, when we were going to school, there were three of us, you know, Jewish kids. And we were, you know, looking around and, you know, ai, dai, dai, dai. It was very important to figure out uh, if there were any Jews around because it was like on a regular basis, Zhadovsky Morde. Well, just regularly, everywhere in the store, you know, everywhere in the tram, you know, on the street. Ah, we are back to Judith. You know, it was so, it was part of life. No longer. No longer, I think, you know, um, Russians, you know, especially if they're not told to think that there's some, you know, uh, black ships around them. You know, they're a pretty tolerant nation. And all of us, you know, basically we're in the same boat. We're survivors in Russia. We're all survivors of this awful 20th century. 56 million Soviet people perished during the 20th century. So in that respect, we're all survivors. You, um, you spoke a little bit about the role of Israeli passports or the, or the presence of Israel as, uh, as an institution or a place that uh, is there for Russian Jews. Now, Russian Jews play, or Jews originally from over there, uh, play quite a role in Israeli politics. And there's some rumors about Lieberman being a, um, a resident, as, as, as one might say. No. So how do, you, how do you see the interaction of, of um, Israeli politics to Russian politics as it occurs either on the national scale or on the kind of populist cultural scale? Uh, I think that, thank you for your question. First of all, no, I don't believe that Lieberman uh, is the head of the um, FSB residentura in Israel. There are plenty of others. You know, he's a Jew from Chesnau, uh, so, and the Moldavian Jews now were trusted Jews. Uh, it's a long story, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into this, okay? So, uh, of course, you know, uh, I think that Russian Federation is uh, using its, uh, so to say, soft power in Israel. And we know that Russian street is pretty influential in uh, Israeli politics. And in fact, you know, this turn to the right in Israeli politics was pretty much the outcome of the uh, 1.5 million uh, Soviet Jews who came to Israel after 1991. So I don't think that you need anything, you know, extra uh, You don't, need, you don't have to do something special. If you talk to Russian Jews in Israel, they're right wing because they grew up in the Soviet Union. And wait a second, you know, and uh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but in this country you probably know that Brighton Beach voted Trump, right? Yeah, so uh, it's nothing, uh, you know, unfortunately those, uh, you know, these illiberal politics, 
apart of what uh, Soviet Jews brought with them both to the United States and to Israel. Venediktov doesn't consider himself a Jew. He's not a Jew. But it's important because, you know, there are people, you know, he uh, is, no, 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 we, we discussed this with him. You know, he's very serious about that, by the way. You know, he, uh, Venediktov, Alexei Venediktov is the editor-in-chief of Echo Moskvy. Just, I'm sorry, you know. Anyway, no, no, but so we're different. I, um, I live in uh, at least part-time. I'm sorry. I, 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 I live at least part-time in Sheepshead Bay, and I have many Russian neighbors. And I've learned, um, I think we have all learned not to have any discussions about Trump because right. they, have, they don't have a bloody idea of liberal democracy. They have no visceral feeling for it. Or appreciate. I'm, I know I'm painting with a very broad brush, and I know there are exceptions. But I really don't want to go into that. But, but the Please. other. <laughs> I'm a citizen of the Russian Federation. I don't have any other passport by the passport of the Russian Federation, and I hate to go into Well, my discussion. question is my question is uh, I, I just read that, I, mean, I don't know if you can speak to this, but uh, there are over 400,000 uh, people, uh, citizens of Israel living, uh, who declared, from what I gather, that they were Jewish. And it turns out they've been identified by the Israeli government or the rabbinate as non-Jewish. That's a tremendous group of people within Israel. Could you comment on that? Because I, fi I find that, that situation very confusing. And maybe you could clarify what, what went on, how they got from, you know, Russia or the Soviet Union to Israel. I, you know, I don't know, you know, it's a statement, not a question, right? So, I have no idea, I'm sorry. I have no idea. I'm sorry, we have time for just one last question, and I told this gentleman over here. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I heard that um, most or even all of the so-called Russian oligarchs are really Jewish. Is that true? And how did that come to be? The Russian oligarchs, right? They all seem to be, have Jewish names. Almost all. I've never seen a non-Jewish name. You just, you know, you, you, you don't look. You probably are looking for Jewish names. First of all, at the beginning of the market reforms in Russia, and at the end of the Soviet Union, a lot of Jews, when, you know, in 1987, private businesses became legal in Russia, even though there was still an article in, in, the, in, the, Russia, in the Soviet criminal code which prosecuted business as a speculation. Still, in 1987, the law was passed that allowed for private businesses to exist. A lot of Jews went into different businesses. Why? You just think about that. Jews were not allowed into the major Soviet institutions, or there was this severe 3% quote on them. So Jews couldn't make a career in the Central Committee of the Communist Party and party organizations. Of course, party was not a party. Communist Party was not a party. It was the form of governance of the, in the Soviet Union. So Jews were not allowed uh, to uh, make a career in this uh, in the party apparat. Jews couldn't make a career in KGB anymore. Jews couldn't make any career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or in any agencies that had to do with the military industry, with, uh, with foreign affairs or with anything that was connected to the intelligence. Jews were allowed in the sciences, medicine, uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, of them. They were allowed into all kind of uh, engineers. You know, they were engineers of different sorts. Many of them went into the computer sounds, uh, sciences. So, if you think about this, you will realize 
that by the time Soviet Union collapsed, Jews, and not just Jews, Chechens who also were not allowed in all the major institutions, Balkars who also were not allowed, all the so-called repressed people, you know, people who were pronounced as enemy, as uh, nation's enemies in the Stalinist time, you know, when there were also, there were severe quotas on that, on them. Uh, Crimea Tatars, uh, uh, Greeks who were kicked out of Crimea, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, there were you know, these minorities who suffered tremendously during the Soviet times. And they couldn't make careers. So of course, when Soviet Union collapsed and opportunities opened in businesses, Jews as well as other minorities were the first to get in. They were prepared for that because at least, you know, they were not good in Marxism, Leninism probably, but they were pretty good in computer sciences. Or they were uh, pretty uh, good in all things that connected to different mechanics, to technical, they were allowed into technical universities. They knew how to do communications. Dmitry Boris Zimin, you know, who, was, who founded the first a uh, company that was traded on the New York Trade Exchange, you know, Beeline, you know, this Russian first seller company. He used to, you know, to, he, he used to work in the super secretive uh, Soviet uh, research institution that created uh, anti-missile system to protect the center of the Russian Federation from the American uh, uh, ballistic missiles. He. Of course, you know, when everything uh, collapsed, when the, the military industrial complex collapsed, he was the first to go into and create this great company. And that's happened with many others. Misha Friedman, uh, who is a billionaire now, you know, he's worth probably 15 billion dollars or something like that. He, when, you know, he graduated from uh, the, um, uh, from the uh, construction university, it was, you know, uh, you couldn't make a real career in the Soviet Union. But, you know, he started in 1987, he started business, you know, uh, with uh, Kodak films, because it was impossible to, uh, uh, to make pictures out of the film. So he, he created the first companies in, uh, in Moscow. And so it goes when you uh, look, you know, how these people uh, started their businesses, they, you know, they, they just, they had no other options but try to somehow to secure lives. There were others. You know, I saw that one of, you know, the rooms is called after Valentin Blavatnik. That's uh, father of uh, Len Blavatnik. Len Blavatnik, I know him since, you know, from uh, Harvard. He, he was the guy who graduated from Harvard B School and he became a legend because in a year time he made his first million in the United States, and then he came to Russia and made billions. But I mean, for Russian Jews, yes, there were a lot of Russian Jews who were, um, who were in businesses. And they were pretty successful because they were first, because they were able to grab these options, because they had, you know, they had more or less appropriate education because there were all kind of connections, you know. Uh, you know, of course, this joke, uh, how to sell uh, oranges in Morocco, right? You have to find the Jew in Morocco. So they, you know, they use those opportunities. Thank you. But you know, there are, now, there are much less, you know, by the way, you know, so-called Jewish oligarchs. There are a lot of uh, so-called oligarchs that no longer oligarchs existed. Oligarchs are people who have influence over power. There are uh, newly made oligarchs. They predominantly KGB generals. They, they are Putin's pals from, uh, from the KGB. Igor Sechin, you know, the head of the bi biggest uh, oil company in the world, Rosneft, the state-owned company. Uh, the company that you know, was created out of uh, uh, grabbing uh, Yukos from Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was put in jail in 2003. Um, he, uh, he also, you know, he had his career in the KGB. Uh, the head of the biggest military industrial complex, Rostech, Chemisov. He was with Putin in Dresden uh, residentura. And so it goes, so so-called oligarchs they, you know, if you scratch, 
you will find a KGB kernel. And they're not Jewish, trust me. Let's continue this conversation in the hall. We've got a reception. We also have some of the books of the winter program teachers on sale uh, or for the classes. So if you want to check out that, please do. And thank you, Evgenia Albots. Thank you.